Okay, I got salt and I need one and a half tablespoons of firmly packed lemon juice. Okay. What are you doing? Uh, I'm looking for the tool that we pack lemon juice with. That's not a thing. I gotta do this by hand? So today we're gonna look at 14 common mistakes that people make in recipes, whether you're a newbie or you're more expensive or more experienced. So let's get into it. So these are not in any particular order, but this is a big one. The first mistake is to not read through the whole recipe. That's right, you should read the whole recipe, including the directions, get out all of your ingredients in advance so that you know you have enough of what you need. There's nothing worse than getting that cookie batter mixed and find out you're out of chocolate chips. That sounds terrible. Number two on our list is assuming that the recipe is always right. In this age of online recipes, it is easy to find unreliable recipes online. Don't assume that just because it didn't turn out the way you expected, that it was your fault. It could very well be the recipe. Even in print, recipes that have ingredients like firmly packed lemon juice, that was not, we didn't invent that. I wish I could have though. <laughs> Sometimes the mistakes are subtle and you might not be able to tell just by looking at it that it's gonna be a little off. But sometimes it's pretty obvious like firmly packed lemon juice that something's a little wrong there. It's obvious to you. <laughs> I spent weeks looking for that lemon juice packer. <laughs> So printed cookbooks go through a lot of editing and a lot of testing. Ideally, there'd be some information in the front about how they tested those recipes. But when you're looking at recipes online, sometimes these bloggers have made something exactly one time and they publish that recipe for you to try. And it may not be a good recipe to begin with. So don't give yourself a hard time if it doesn't turn out just the right way. It could very well be the recipe. Number three on our list is something that affects the newbies more than those that are more experienced, and that is dealing with the messed up imperial system of measurements. It's easy to mix up tablespoons and teaspoons when they've been abbreviated in a recipe. So let's take a look at the abbreviations for tablespoon. So tablespoons are most often capitalized. You might see them abbreviated with simply a capital T. You may also see a capital T, B, S, P, or you may see T, B and even sometimes a lowercase tbsp. Let's take a look at the abbreviations for teaspoon. You may see this written with a lowercase t or tsp. Occasionally in poorly written recipes, the t will be capitalized, but if it's only followed by sp, that's still a teaspoon. Now the reason that this is actually important is that a tablespoon is three times the volume of a teaspoon. And this kind of mix up is generally avoidable if you use recipes with mass instead of teaspoons and tablespoons. Continuing with the theme of downfall of the imperial measurement system is number four, confusing mass measurement with volumetric measurement. As a matter of fact, if you go to Google right now and ask, hey, how many ounces are in one cup? It will tell you an answer. And that may not be the measurement that you actually want. The root of this problem is that we use the same word, ounces, to measure two different things, weight and volume. So you need to use context to figure out which one you're measuring. If you're measuring a liquid like milk, then you would be measuring in fluid ounces. If you're measuring something like flour or sugar, you would be measuring in weight ounces, and they're different. Another problem that we see in this same vein is if a recipe calls for 1.5 pounds of something, that's actually one pound plus eight ounces, because there are 16 ounces in a pound. So one and a half pounds, one pound, eight ounces. Not one pound, five ounces. Good luck. We actually have a whole video on this topic and why you should use grams to measure your foods. Check that video out. After you're done with this one. Sure. Yeah. The fifth item on our list is misunderstanding directed ingredients. So this is the difference between chopped walnuts and walnuts, comma, chopped. To show the difference between those two, I thought we'd do a little demonstration. Doug, I'd like you to measure a half a cup of walnuts. Good, that's about right. Let's measure that to see how much these walnuts weigh. 53 grams. About 53 grams. Now, if I chop these, the weight will remain the same, 53 grams, but the volume may change. Let's return this to your measuring cup. Now that these walnuts have been chopped, they fill up the cup a little less than before. The weight is about the same. We lost a gram to the cutting board and the knife, but the volume itself is less than it was before. It's probably about 7 eighths of a half cup. So it's important to note in the recipe what it says to do. If it says one half cup of chopped nuts, chop first and then measure. If it says one half cup of nuts, comma, chopped, then measure them and chop as we did here. 
So the importance of not making this mistake varies based on the item that you're chopping. So if it's nuts, it's not gonna make a huge difference. If it's something like mushrooms, it'll make a bigger difference. So you should definitely watch out. Mistake number six is ignoring the proper temperature for your ingredients. So I had this problem a lot when I first started cooking. I didn't see the reason of taking something out of the refrigerator to let it come up to room temperature when I'm literally about to mix it up and throw it in a 350 degree oven. But it can make a big difference. So things like eggs, blend together better with the other ingredients when they are room temperature. So it's important that they are all approximately the same temperature for better blending. It's especially important that you follow any directions in the recipe for fat. Your fats should be the proper, mm. <laughs> Can we not talk about my fats? Your fat, your fats, your fats, any fats in the recipe should be used at the temperature listed in the recipe, whether that be cold butter or melted butter. If there is no temperature listed, you should assume room temperature. So another benefit of doing this is that if you're following our advice from number one and checking all your ingredients and getting them out, you can use that to set things on the counter that need to come up to room temperature so that by the time you're done, you're ready to go. Mistake number seven is using the wrong volume measuring tool. We can measure dry and wet ingredients in cups, but there is a right and a wrong tool to use for each item. So for dry ingredients, it's best to use a cup like this so that you can level it off. And with a wet, it's best to use a cup like this so you can fill it up to the line, see the line, and now you have the right amount of volume. It's very difficult to put dry ingredients in a cup like this and get them nice and level on the top to match that line. Near impossible. It's also near impossible to fill this cup with a liquid and not spill it on the way to your bowl. Mistake number eight is mixing up baking soda and baking powder. They are both chemical leaveners, but they do behave differently in your recipe. It's important that you not switch one for the other. Be sure that if your recipe says baking powder, that your can says baking powder, or your box says baking soda if the recipe says baking soda. We actually have a whole video on this topic where we show you how to tell if they're good or bad. We talk about their function and the recipes, and we show you what happens if you don't do it quite right. Check that one out. So mistake number nine is using the wrong type of flour. These are all different types of flour? Every single one of these is a different type of flour. I didn't even go shopping. These all came out of my baking drawer. We have all-purpose flour, bleached and unbleached, self-rising, cake flour, bread flour. If a recipe calls for a specific flour, that's the one you should use. If it just says flour, assume all-purpose flour. Okay, so what if you use the wrong type of flour? I mean, will things explode or? Uh, probably no explosion, but it will affect the texture. If you try to make a yeast bread with something other than bread flour, unless the recipe has already accounted for that, it won't rise. Maybe we need to make a whole video on this and all the different types of flour. Mistake number 10 is not revisiting your recipes to make notes when you're finished. One time I found a recipe for turkey and spinach meatballs that I thought sounded pretty good. So I made it and no one really enjoyed it. And I didn't make any notes, because why would I make that recipe again? But there it sat in my recipe collection, and about a year later I thought, oh, that recipe sounds pretty good, and I made it again. And guess what? No one liked it again. Had I made some notes, we would have been spared that second awful experience. And the notes that you put on the recipes can be things like, I didn't like this, or we loved this, or I should make this change, or I did make this change when I made it last time so that over time you can improve the recipes and get them closer and closer to something that's just perfect for you. And once you make a recipe, it's no longer the recipe of the publisher of the cookbook. It's your recipe, and you can make it how you like it. And you can see that Lisa has made all sorts of notes over all the recipes in her various cookbooks. Mistake number 11 is not noticing divided ingredients. You'll see recipes all the time that say one cup sugar divided, and then later in the instructions, it'll say use a half cup sugar here. And if you just take the one cup sugar that you've got out and you dump it in at that point, you have a bad time. This is a mistake that I still make sometimes, and it would be easily avoided if I would make notes. So when I see that one cup sugar and I know that I'm gonna put half of it in the batter and half of it in the topping, then if I make a note at the top, one half plus one half or something, something to trigger my mind to measure that separately, that would help me in this time making the recipe and in future times as well. If you're a recipe writer, go ahead and split it up for people. Oh, I would love that. So mistake number 12 is not understanding the equipment in your kitchen. 
So we all have lots of equipment in our kitchen. The person who wrote the recipe has equipment, we have equipment, you have equipment, but it's all different. And so to increase your chances of getting a recipe correct, you need to make sure that the equipment you do have first is calibrated and working properly. This includes making sure that the temperature on your oven is actually correct. So some things may be impossible or just very hard if you don't have the right gear. For example, getting a very low simmer on an electric stove is very difficult due to the way electric stoves work. If in case you don't know this, they actually work by just going on full blast and then turning off for a while, and then going full blast and turning off for a while, which is really bad for a low simmer. There are adjustments that you can make to overcome these obstacles, but it's impossible if you don't understand the equipment that you have. All right, we're on the home stretch now. Number 13 on our list is misunderstanding the precision required for cooking versus baking. These two things are very different. Cooking is very forgiving. You add a little more spice, no big deal. You want a little more flavor, add some of that, no problem. But baking is much more like chemistry and needs to be properly balanced. So if you've been successful in cooking and you're kind of a willy-nilly chef, that's great. But if you try to translate that skill to baking, you may find it much more difficult to get good results. And vice versa, if you are really good at baking and used to the precision required there and you try to transition over to regular cooking, you may find that the recipes there don't contain enough details and you might find it frustrating. But the fact is, cooking is just more freeing in that sense. Give it a try. It's much less punishing in case something goes wrong. All right, now before we get to number 14, if you've liked this video so far, hit thumbs up. If you'd like more videos on kitchen education and recipes, hit subscribe, maybe hit the bell if you've really liked it. Now, last but not least, number 14. The biggest mistake I think anyone can make in the kitchen is thinking you can't cook. We have lots of video evidence that even Doug can cook. The key to this one is start easy. Don't start at culinary school level recipes when you're just getting started. Start with pancakes, start with a salad, Maybe do a little bit of extra meat. Maybe do some slow and low cooking, etc. Work your way up. Don't start at the end and think, oh, I can't do this. Start with something simple, and before you know it, it'll become a natural, it'll be great. Check out some of our other videos. We can help you along the way with some kitchen education. And we'll see you next time.